Hello everyone! Quite some time ago, I released a few videos where I showcased a mini portable welding machine for spot welding, specifically for batteries. Several versions were developed, which differed slightly from each other. I highly recommend checking out those videos where I explained in detail how the circuit works and tested it. The device from the first video still works perfectly and has never let me down. In a few words, I'll explain what the circuit consists of. 3. Main components The INI 555 timer, which generates a single pulse when the button is pressed. The output of the timer is loaded onto an emitter follower, which acts as a current amplifier and is designed for proper control of a series of powerful field effect transistors. And the power section consists of a bunch of parallel connected, in channel field effect transistors. When we press the button, the timer generates a control pulse which goes to the follower and opens the top switch. In turn, it sends a positive signal to the gates of the field effect transistors, causing them to activate. All the welding current, which is hundreds and even thousands of amperes, flows precisely through the field effect transistors, and they must withstand such current. As I mentioned earlier, there were two versions of this welding fed up. In the first, the field effect transistors were controlled by a relay, and in the second, by an emitter follower. The circuits work the same way. Well, I think you notice that we have two power sources in the circuit. One is the power source, which supplies the current for welding, and the second is a 12 volt power source that powers the control circuit. It could have been avoided by powering the control directly from the power source, but during welding, there will be significant voltage drops. A voltage, and if the control signal is less than 10 volts, the field effect transistors may not fully open, which will lead to increased resistance in their open channel, overheating, and possibly failure. The second power source is independent. In my case, it's a 12 volt nickel cadmium battery. Why did I make another video on this topic if everything was already said and shown? Firstly, the device has become even more compact because I decided to try assembling everything with SMD components. And the second reason is these wonderful barrels. These are ionisters or supercapacitors. I won't talk about them because everyone knows everything about them. They are partly a battery, partly a capacitor. Unlike capacitors, ionisters can have a colossal capacity while having similar sizes. These samples have as much as 500 farads. They are still far from being batteries, but ionisters have two more huge advantages. The number of charge discharge cycles is up to a million, meaning they are literally eternal, and they have colossal charge and discharge currents. The rated voltage of ionisters is small, usually a few volts. They have an incredibly low internal resistance. Because of this, they can charge and discharge with large currents. My samples, in particular, can easily be discharged with currents of tens of amperes. Did I say tens? I was mistaken. The maximum discharge current for this ionister is over 200A. Connect a couple of ionisters in parallel, and there you have 400A. Three ionisters give you 600A, and so on. In general, you get the hint. Let's try welding with ionisters. Our setup is a timer with a power switch. Press the button, and the current from the ionisters goes through the field effect switches to the welding point. But before we do that, a little about the components of the circuit and what it is capable of. Power. Transistors. In Noevo, SMD transistors 06 and 03 were used. These are low voltage and channel field effect switches rated at 60A, with a pulse short term current up to 280. The transistors are rated at only 25V, but this is more than sufficient for our purposes. These transistors were chosen for a reason. Firstly, I got them for free since I desoldered them from old motherboards, and secondly, the initial goal was to assemble the device using SMD components. Thirdly, the characteristics of the transistors themselves. Unlike other powerful MOSFETs, they can be controlled with a lower gate voltage. If we look at the technical documentation, we will see that, even with a few volts on the gate, the transistor is almost fully open, and its on-state resistance is only 9 m ohms and at 10 volts on the gate, it's already 6 m ohms. And this is even less than the popular RF3205 transistors. The lower the on-state resistance, the less the switch will heat up. But less doesn't mean none at all. 
The transistors will heat up because they still conduct massive currents, albeit briefly. Make sure to provide adequate cooling for the transistors. In my case, the cooling isn't the best. This is a massive tinned and copper wire reinforced contact pad. But that's not enough. The board is designed to accommodate eight transistors. In my case, only six are installed, but I think that's enough to start with. In theory, our circuit can briefly handle currents of 1500A. Testing. We apply about 9 to 12 volts to the control system and connect an oscilloscope to the output of the repeater. I specifically replaced the non-latching button with a switch so you could more clearly see the delay. On the oscilloscope, we can notice two peaks, upper and lower. The repeater is functioning properly. Next, we filter out the AC on the oscilloscope to understand the minimum and maximum pulse duration, and consequently, the welding time. The minimum pulse or delay lasts only 50 milliseconds. The maximum is slightly more than a second. This is the welding time, but only with the value specified in the diagram. There may be some variation, and this will be related to the error of the components themselves. If desired, the trimmer resistor can be replaced with a variable one, create a small scale, and calibrate it based on the oscilloscope readings. You can check the operation without an oscilloscope by connecting a small power incandescent lamp to the output of the repeater, 12 minus 13 repeated 14 times, and it should light up brightly and turn off depending on the delay time. Next, the correct operation of the switches themselves is checked. Connect the power source. In my case, it's a 12 volt battery from an uninterruptible power supply. Next, connect the load. In my case, the load is a powerful 100 watt incandescent lamp. The lamp, by the way, is 8V. Run it several times in a row. Check the heating on the switches. With such a load, they shouldn't heat up at all. Everything works as it should. Now replace the switch with the button and connect supercapacitors as the power source. In my case, there are two supercapacitors connected in parallel, each with 500 farads. The electrodes are made from copper wire with a diameter of 3 millimeters. The holders are regular, brass ones from a hardware store. The power wires are 8 AWG, with silicone heat-resistant insulation. I use these wires for my powerful laboratory power supply, two segments of one meter each. It would be good to shorten them, but I won't because after this experiment they will be used for the powerful power supply. In general, for those interested, the resistance of a one meter segment of such wire is about milliohms and we have two meters. Considering the currents flowing, even with such wires we will experience noticeable voltage drops. They can be reduced by shortening the length of the wire. We charge the supercapacitors, stock up on nickel strip. For battery welding, prepare the battery itself and head to the yard. The first attempts at welding were unsuccessful. The voltage on the supercapacitors is low, plus there are losses in the wires. Therefore, it was decided to try connecting four supercapacitors in series, charge them to the nominal voltage and test it. Of course, by connecting in series, we increase the voltage, but several problems arise immediately. First, the internal resistance of the supercapacitor batteries increases, and, with high currents, they will heat up. Secondly, as the internal resistance increases, the discharge current decreases. Consequently, the welding result. Attempts to weld with short durations again were not successful. Something more or less resembling welding was achieved with durations of about one second, but with such a duration, the heating of the strip is significant. The strip can only be torn off, so to speak, with force. Immediately after these experiments, 
I checked the heating on the transistors and supercapacitors. The switches were cool, a little over 30 degrees, but the supercapacitors heated up to 45 degrees. However, it should be noted that within a short period, I charged them about 10 times, with currents of 20 amps and discharged them with currents of 60 to 80 amps. Next, I charged the supercapacitor battery and loaded it onto a ballast. The current was no more than 60 amps. In the case of a short circuit, it was no more than 80 amps. This is clearly not enough for welding. But it's important to understand that the needle of the measuring device isn't that fast. And naturally, it can't record peak current values, but it's good enough for a visual assessment of the situation. I had six of these ionizers in stock, 500 each. Ferrets. If you connect every two in parallel, and then three of these assemblies in series, it will be much better. But that's a topic for another video, as there will be further development of this project. Well, as it is, you can download the board from the archive right now. You'll find the link in the description. Assemble the circuit. Find high current model batteries 2C or 3C. Connect them to the circuit and weld batteries to your heart's content. The circuit works very well, only the supercapacitors let it down. And a few words about the further development of this project. Imagine a standalone welding device weighing no more than 300 grams. The device will consist of a lithium ion battery, supercapacitors, a power unit with transistors, and a supercapacitor charging system. The batteries will charge the supercapacitors with a sufficiently high current, and the supercapacitors themselves will directly participate in the welding. With this setup, it is possible to completely eliminate the second power source for the control system, since it is planned to ensure that the main batteries are disconnected at the moment of welding, and the voltage from them could be redirected to the control circuit. In general, support the development of this project with your like, and share the video with friends. That's probably all for today. You will find all the necessary links in the description. And with that, I have to say goodbye. As always, this was Kazianaka with you. Until we meet again.